Gracious God, we reflect on the joys and concerns brought before us today. We come to your house to worship you, to prepare for the coming week, to reorient our minds and hearts in a world full of distraction. We realize this as we lift up our prayers to you, gracious God, who hears all the joys, sorrows, and supplications of our hearts. We come to this place to remember that we are one people and one mission in this place and across the world. Now let us honor your son as we repeat the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please stand and sing, Christ, there is no east or west. Today's scripture reading is from Acts 11, verses 1 through 18. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went to the house of the uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and a trance, in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by the four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. And I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, and kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean can ever enter my mouth. The voice from heaven came a second time. 
Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered into the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all of the household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them, and he had come on to us all at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance and leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I went to the restroom just now, I remembered the story of a pastor. Now, he's gone on to be with the Lord, but he was retired at this time. And I know our sound people turned off the microphone. But in this time, the microphone was left on. And so, I trust you, but I unplugged it. <laughs> We sang a hymn, I will not be afraid, I will trust in you. That was the opening of worship, and you may have noticed I took time to scribble it down. For our high school graduates that are going into college, some of it's going to be familiar territory, such as listening to the teacher, writing papers. Your papers will be longer you know, sometimes in bachelor's work, it was approaching 20 pages required. And, of course, it's going to be listening closer to lectures. Uh, but all of that won't be familiar territory. And they, as I did, and those of you who went to college know of as well, it will be unfamiliar territory in a number of different ways. So listen to some stories about that. Bishop Richard Wilkie and his wife Julia were pastors of a church. And they sought to get in those who were attending college, keep them in church. Uh, they did everything possible in a local church, but with no effective results. The college students knew their church was doing that. And it must have gotten a hold of their hearts because later Bishop Wilkie found out, when he was a pastor, of course, that they had on campus, an on campus group that met together, had read scripture talked over what they had learned both from Scripture and in the college experience and prayed together and kept up with each other. Later, you see, those who, when they returned home, attended church and they kept a small group going. He then asked them why and found out. What a good way to go into new territory and to not be afraid to start a new group, uncertain of whether or not it would work. Praise the Lord, it did. Did you know that was the beginning in the Methodist church among the beginning group, groups that met off campus and 20 years ago, no more than that, Almost 30 years ago, more small groups meet outside the church property than inside. That's our country right now. 
What a challenge for local churches to believe that the only place for small groups is not in the building. Wow. Uh, there is a small, well, there is a large church in the United States. You know the times that large church meets together? Three times a year. Christmas, Easter, the weekend of July 4th. Otherwise, they are small groups meeting in different locations, some of them across the country. They send support into the church, financial support, as a group. And the church pays the salaries of more than one staff person. But nothing for church property except renting a place three times a year. It's among the faster growing churches. I read about it years ago. Forgive me. I don't remember the name. But that has stuck with me. What new insights. Like a small group on campus. You know, if they met with that in mind, we could count that as attendance here. What a different way. Chuck Hunter was a great teacher of evangelism. He's deceased now. But he was not only known for the teaching he did, but for the work he did in local churches. One example is his church had been in decline, pretty much staying level, but being level all the time is actually in decline because in comparison to the community around you, if it is growing and your church is staying the same, it's in decline. What they did is, is go out and interview their neighbors. Finding out they were unchurched, they listened to them. What subjects would you like to hear from the pulpit? What style of music do you like? Would you like to be in small groups? About worship, they found what is the uh, different style of music like we sing here. While I was on the board of ministry for 10 years, I will always remember a small church that was growing. You know what style of music they used? Bluegrass, guitar, banjo, fiddle, and all the instruments of bluegrass. And they used hymns that fit that setting. This definitely was down Chuck Hunter's Road. Now, they did more of a contemporary service, sort of like ours. But there's no guarantee that will work. Good question. What style would work best here? We won't know until we have a group. Raise this with your new pastor to interview unchurched people with those basic questions. Will you come to worship? What style of music do you love? Will you be a part of a small group? Wow. New ways for growth in the church. That's uncomfortable ways. That's threatening ways. That's outside our boundaries. But after all, didn't Jesus go outside the boundary? He was expected to be king of the Jews, a royal king. But he brought a new understanding of royalty. A real royal person in Jesus' mind is one that gives his life, uses new threatening approaches to reach people outside the faith. Then there is young adults nowadays. A national study has discovered, and I've mentioned this, please remember it. Most often, young adults get into the church. Many of them believe we are for ourselves, period. Right or wrong, that's what most young adults believe. Studies, multiple studies show that. 
number one way to attract young adults is when we are working for people outside this church. It can be as simple as one family. It can be as simple as seeing if we can volunteer to help people rebuild their houses. Simple. Inviting unchurched people to join us. That's the number one way nationally churches reach the unchurched. Second, they then will be more willing to become a member of a small group predominantly meets off campus. Right or wrong, that's the truth. And after being in that for a while, they'll come to worship. What a different way. When I first started the ministry, it was small groups first. About 15 years later, it was worship first. Now, many churches are thinking that way. But for the past 20 years, it's been us working outside these doors to help those outside the church. And then small groups off campus. We're not used to that. In some appointments, I hate it, I was not able to try it here. I began small groups off campus. One I remember is we met at Shoney's and Donaldson. Another I remember is we ate at Panera Bread at another appointment. And what we did is we had scripture to read during the week. And then we came together and listened what we learned. And then we made a commitment. I will do this, whatever it is, for Christ this coming week. And when we met again, everyone would say, I did it, I had this experience, or I did not do it. We loved each other, and we would hear, why didn't you do it? What will it take this week? Do we need to call and check up on each other? What a difference that made. What if three or four lay people would have joined me in those appointments? They didn't. But what if three or four lay people had? Would more have come into the church? Common sense says yes. Where are we? That's a boundary for us to cross. Uh, my retirement right now is a boundary for me. I've talked to some of you about what to do in retirement. Many of you have said, find a new purpose. That's what I'm seeking to do. And I am wrestling with what to do. You know, I'll no longer be preparing a sermon every week. I'll no longer be meeting with administrative and programs committees. I will no longer be coming to worship for more than leading. I'll be following. Oh, I can't name everything else. You might be able to. That's a change in life. A radical change. Sort of down the same road as the changes I've mentioned. What will I do? I can envision it, but my experience is my vision is not always accurate to what happens. Acts 2. <clears throat> that is the, you might say, the Jewish setting for what we heard read from Acts 11. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit falls on the believing community, and all of a sudden they are speaking in tongues, that is, giving witness to Jesus Christ, and being heard in the languages, the various languages that people speak. So it's a combination of speaking in that language and being heard in their own language. Listen to the people they speak to. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Serim, and even the Arabs. Did you know none of those would have been welcome in the synagogue? 
And they're the ones that hear it all together with the Jews. So in the Pentecost experience, the word is going out to the familiar people of worship and the unfamiliar. The result, what is it, 2,000 that come to Christ in that one event? The focus was outside the church. What you just heard in the reading from Acts 11 is that the apostle Peter is going to a house again of a non-Jewish family. You remember the scene? He has a dream, and coming down from heaven is food he shouldn't eat. And the Spirit tells him, eat this food. In the dream, no, he says, this is not my food. Eat this food. That prepares him for three guests that come to his door. They knock on the door. And in response, Simon is told that, he goes outside. Again, there are people from the wrong bunch. But nevertheless, he follows them and gets to the house of unfamiliar people and hears they of all people are ready to hear the good news of Jesus. He shares it, and just like the Holy Spirit had fallen upon Jews and Gentiles, now it's just Gentiles. You ever had a person join here? I imagine you have. Y'all been here a long time. You sort of wish you'd not join. Did you welcome them? Did you go up and tell them you're home here? Oh, I doubt if that ever happened. <laughs> Don't kid me, it does. Did you go out of your way in an uncomfortable zone, crossing a boundary to say, welcome? Did you make sure you became friends with them? That's like Jesus. Think about it. The everlasting Son of God, who was definitely not like us. Why, the Jewish people of his day were aggravated because he went to Gentile houses. Was aggravated that he hung out with traitors, alcoholics, and those in prostitution. Uh, you shouldn't do that. He did. That's the way he was. In many ways, like Peter was when he went to the house of Cornelius. So that leads us into Acts 11. Listen to some of the places, perhaps I've not mentioned, where the boundary was crossed. Peter took a gamble on explaining the gospel to people not in the community of faith. Oh, one fellow, forgive me, I don't remember his name, but I remember his story. Oh, this has been years and years ago. But in England, he would go to a public part and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Predominantly, people who had no faith would listen to him. So he would be interrupted with questions or challenges or people fed up with his preaching. And he would always answer the question if it was that or address a person with love and care that just wanted to interrupt. What a different way to proclaim the gospel. Or also in this particular passage, as you heard, the Holy Spirit fell on people that we would think least likely. That's the way the Spirit is. The Spirit gives breath. That's breath to everyone. Believers, 
non-believers. Those who do good works, those who do bad works. Those who care, those who don't. The Spirit is there. And when I am about to give witness to a person about Christ, I know the Spirit is in them. So I ask, prepare me first to speak what you want to speak, Lord, and prepare them to hear it. The Spirit is in them. Mike Slaughter was a great Methodist preacher. He's retired now. He was appointed as pastor of a small church in a small town. At the time, it was bad economics. People all over the place were unemployed. So the first thing he did was, was lead that primarily senior adult church to go to the homes of those they knew were unemployed could not find jobs. House to house they went. And guess what happened? Slowly, those that were unemployed saw the church cared. And they slowly, not rapidly, slowly became a part of that church. Think now in a small town. Imagine here in this town, a church of a thousand plus in attendance. In that little town, it happened first because the church demonstrated care for those outside the church. Like Cornelius right here in the story. Outside the church, Peter demonstrated the care of Jesus for him and his household. Uh, by the way, again, for our college people, don't be afraid. Did you know that don't be afraid occurs 365 times in the Bible? What a short phrase. Don't be afraid. A great example of that is when Mary, the mother of Jesus, is visited by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit says unto her, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son. She'd never been married. Never had the male-female relationship in order to do so. But listen, Mary. Your son, the Son of God, will be great and considered the Son of the Most Hi, Luke 1, 31 to 32a. All right, when the women are visiting the tomb of Jesus, now an empty tomb, what does the angel or the messenger say to them? But don't be afraid. There that phrase is again. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has been raised. Come see the place where he laid. Don't let fear determine your actions. Recognize holy ground. I love it. It's going to be years ago. I was serving Trinity in the United Methodist Church in East Nashville. I was on vacation, and a fellow, now he's known as James Hughes, Dr. James Hughes, but I knew him by the name growing up. He was known as Jimbo Hughes. And I still call him Jimbo, and he still gets a kick out of it. I asked Jimbo at the time he was on the, the conference level, so he had Sundays free, to come and preach while I was out. Uh, he did. And I'll always remember the story about his sermon. It was on the call of Moses in Exodus 3. You remember the scene? Moses, caring for livestock, looks up on a hill. A mountain, it says here, but in Tennessee, a mountain of the Holy Lands are tall Tennessee hills. He sees on a hill a burning bush. It's not burning up. So finally, he walks up to it, wondering what on earth is going on. And among the first other messages he hears, Take off your shoes, Moses. You are walking on holy ground. So guess what? Jimbo did. 
right before the reading of Scripture, he took off his shoes and he took off his socks. I was on holy ground, he said. I was sharing the message of God. Holy ground. Peter and Cornelius' household, where Peter is proclaiming, it's holy ground because it is a place where God is working and continues his work. This is holy ground. Outside these walls, too, there is holy ground on which we're called to work. For me, holy ground is simply the moment when God uses me for his work and maybe during and maybe after I realize that's happening or that happened next focus forward you know uh, as I get older I begin, I'm beginning to focus more on the past than the future. Those of you who are younger a bit than I am, older a bit than I am, I'm 66. Are you experiencing that? It's an easy temptation. But God, even as we get older, says, focus forward. A great biblical example is Abraham and Sarah too old to have a child? What does God do? Forward gives them a child. Forward leads them to a land he has for them. Forward they are in the family of Moses. Wow, what's going to happen there? Forward all the people that followed Moses in his family. Forward. I'm going to make myself focus more forward than back. I love the way one person put it. He says, if you're no longer looking forward, then you're dead. <laughs> I like that. As Paul writes in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Faith is the assurance of what? Things hoped for. And the things unseen. What haven't you seen yet? That's looking forward. Why, well, in this experience of bringing Cornelius and his family and friends to Christ, it's a forward-looking event when people not like us will be in these walls and give this church new seed, new plants, new growth, new vision that we may not like. I believe, though, the most important people to listen to are people who have come to Christ for the first time. People that have transferred here. Those who have transferred may bring dreams that they have seen work in the church. Those who Christians for the first time bring insights <clears throat> into what unchurched people think and can help us get a God-centered reply. Don't be afraid. To our graduates and everyone here, don't be afraid. Open your hearts and open your lives to new ways and new settings and new people. A part of it, of course, is being open to your new pastor and his family. But a part of it, too, 
is being open and receptive to whoever you meet in the community. Not like you. Neither is Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the people of God said, Love divine, all love's excelling. That's one of my favorite hymns, and I'm glad it was picked. It's the United Methodist Hymnal 384. It will also be on the screen. The invitation goes to you if you would like for me to pray with you, or if you have a moving experience in the Lord you need to honor. Please come at this time as we sing together. <clears throat> Of course, to you here, your financial offering can be left in the plate right outside. For those who have watched this over the internet, of course, the postal mail is possible. Or if you look at our website, there is a way to give there as well. All that seeks to let Christ work further through the church. Hear the blessing. Our Father God, we know that our many here that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, to have their lives informed and empowered by your Holy Spirit. And we know there are many outside the walls of this church who also need to hear the gospel, first through loving actions, moving toward friendship, and then looking for the opportunity to share your good news of how you have helped us individually. Take us, use us, 
in surprising and threatening ways to share your good news. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen.